And we're back. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dark Phoenix Gaming, and welcome back to Let's Play Mass Effect Legendary Edition with Vin Shepard. Last time we left off, we completed our mission on Vermeer and taking out Saren's research facility. Sadly, however, there were losses, and Ashley was killed in the process. And we nearly had to shoot Rex also from the episode before that. And we happened to learn that this Reaper that's Saren's ship that he's been carting around is actually a sentient AI. And there's rather a lot of them. And uh, they want to destroy all organic life. I am vastly oversimplifying, of course, but yes. And now, the only thing there is left to do is tell the council and get ourselves a fleet to stop them with. As we have to get to the planet of Ilos, where the Mu Relay is located, which... Sorry, I got that slightly backwards. We have to get to the Mu Relay, which is located within the Terminus systems, where... Council forces merely entering it could start a war. And that... Relay leads to the planet of Ilos. Which... Ilos... Is where the conduit that Saren's been looking for this whole time is located. So we have to get there. But... I'm choosing deliberately to not interact with these... with our console for the galaxy map for one very simple reason. The moment we do that, it will kick off a chain of events that will take us back to the Citadel. And once we do that, there's no turning back. That is quite literally the point of no return. Although, arguably completing the last of the planets is a sort of point of no return. Before we do that and head on back, though, there's a few things we need to take care of. We need to go talk to our crew members and make sure they don't have anything else to say about the mission as it stands so far. And... We have a few codex entries I still have yet to read, so I want to read those on camera before you go off and do anything else. Commander, are you coming to check up on me? You look much better. How are you feeling? Dr. Chakwas assures me I am going to be fine. I was impressed with her knowledge of Asari physiology. Yeah, you said that the last time one of the beacons made you have to go take a nap, Liara. Please get some new dialogue. This is feeling repetitive. You're in good hands. Dr. Chakwas knows what she's doing. I've been thinking about Saren. I actually feel a little sorry for him now. Yeah. He's basically a slave for Sovereign at this point, And he can't even see that. As he's in so deep. As much as he's a bastard, and nearly everything that's gone wrong so far is his fault, you do got to kind of feel for the guy. Not going to stop us from opposing him, of course, but even so. He's become a slave to the Reapers, and he can't even see it. He is trapped inside his own mind. Part of him senses his identity slowly being swallowed up by Sovereign, but he is powerless to stop it. I wonder how he first fell into Sovereign's trap. Did he think he could somehow stop the Reapers from returning? Or was he simply driven by a lust for power and glory? Well, 
Given the few tidbits that we've learned about Saren through Anderson, among other things, I'm inclined to think it was a lust for power. But I suppose we're never really going to know for sure. Whatever Saren's reasons may have been, they're long gone now. He has to be stopped. Yes, I suppose you're right. He may be Sovereign's victim, but he is also a threat to all life as we know it. Uh, let's not spend every free minute talking about Saren. It is bad enough we are chasing him across the galaxy. Hey, you're the one who brought it up. I should go. Goodbye, Commander. Okay. I'm gonna save Caden for last, actually. Given that little bit of drama we had concerning who got left behind on the actual Vermeer mission, that seems like a good thing to close out the crew conversations on, really. Hey, Garrus, you got anything to say? Commander, I wanted to thank you. Oh, I. Th I don't have time for this. Oh. Yeah, Goodbye. we've had that conversation with Garrus already. It's like his conversation tree is all tapped out. And hey, I forgot about this. Yeah, Kira, he, Commander Rentola, and a couple of their men are on board. You have my gratitude, Commander. Most people would have left our team behind. The captain considers the mission a success. I defer to his judgment. Glad I could help. Good luck, Commander Shepard. It was an honor working with you, Commander Shepard. Despite the losses, our mission was a success. My superiors will duly honor Chief Williams for her actions. Her sacrifice has earned humanity a great deal of respect from my people. Ash was a hell of a soldier. She knew what the risks were, but she did what she had to. Of course. The grim reality that every soldier must accept. Rest assured, Commander, my men and I will not forget what you have accomplished here. We will leave your ship as soon as you reach your next destination. Perhaps we'll have the opportunity to work together again someday. That'd be nice. I kind of like Kirihi, honestly, even if he was a bit of a tactless idiot towards Rex, who is one of my favorite characters of all time, and, and all that. Yeah, I like him. Commander, things got heated back on Vermeer. You did what you had to do. I respect your choice. I appreciate what you did, Rex. I won't forget it. Just to make sure it was worth it. Sarah and I can do that. What he's done. We'll have him soon enough. Then he can answer for his crimes. He'll do more than just answer if I have anything to say about it. Yeah, nothing else to ask Rex about. So long, Rex. Shepard. Yeah, when we say answer, we're probably going to end up shooting him dead. Not going to lose too much sleep over that myself, given how much of a bastard he's proven to be so far. Hey, Tally. Hey, Shepard. Do you need something? I should go. Oh. See you later. Looks like Tally's all tapped out on conversation topics. Which is honestly a bit surprising. I would have thought Tally or Garrus would have had something to say about the fact that Saren's ship is basically a sentient AI. I'm a little bit surprised they didn't have anything to add on that point. It's kind of weird, to be honest. Hey, Caden. Hope you're feeling a little better. So close now. When we deliver everything, the council will have to mobilize around us. It will be a fitting tribute to Ash if we were able to rally him all together to the council. It's been a struggle, but we've earned their respect now. Then at the forefront, even back in the Plex, you'll probably get another star of Terra out of this. I don't think I've ever met a woman like you. You haven't had the easiest life. Separated from duty. 
But when the mission's complete, it'll be different. At least I hope so. Ma'am. Oh, yeah. That sounds wonderful, Lieutenant. In the meantime, we save the game. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. I love how Shepard just throws in the in the meantime we save the galaxy thing like the fucking afterthought. It's great. What's your opinion on the last mission? Input? Hell, I don't know. We're fighting giant machines from outside the galaxy. Should I be afraid of them? Or in all of them? Anything so old, so intelligent. Yeah, they've been around a while. So were the Turians. We gave them a boot in the ass. I think we're gonna need a bigger boot. Commander. Well, it's an excuse to go shopping for a larger size of boots, then. So there's that. But yeah. About the whole thing with Williams. You holding up okay? I wanted to see how you're dealing with Ash's death. Dealing. Sorry for anything I said back there. Hey, I get it. Heat of the moment, you say some stuff you don't necessarily mean. Everyone does it. I understand. I don't like losing people either. I've served for years. I've never lost a soldier under my command. Not to hostile action, anyway. You don't mind my asking. How did you deal with the losses on Elysium? It was my job to get everyone out safe. I failed. I vowed not to let that happen again. Same here. I'll remember her, and I'll do better for her. Yeah, I guess that's all we can do. Thanks for the advice, ma'am. Yeah, no problem. Personal input? Question mark. Just trying to get a sense of where the crew's at. Thoughts? I've wasted enough of your time for now, Commander. We'll have time for personal debriefings later. Okay. We'll talk later, Caden. I'd like that. Oh, wait. I just realized. We do still have one more conversation we gotta have. With Joker. He always has some interesting stuff to say, and he probably won't, but let's see if Presley's got anything to say. If anyone has to take over for Captain Anderson, I'm glad it's you. I'm not sure about having non humans on it. Carry on, Presley. Yes, ma'am. Wait, didn't we have this conversation with him already? I'm confused. Yes, Commander. Carry on, Presley. We did. Yes, ma'am. I guess the game doesn't expect that I go back to try to talk to him again, so it loops in an old conversation. That's kind of weird, to be honest. Hey, Joker. Commander. I know it couldn't have been easy for you down there. Making the call between Alenko and Williams must have been... I'm sorry, ma'am. I just don't know if I could have done it. Yeah, there is no right choice for something like that. I just hope I never have to go through it again. No, I'm not blaming you, Commander. I'm just... I mean, it's hard, you know? Saren's still out there, Joker. Hold it together. We need you. Don't worry. I won't let you down. I want to be there when you make that son of a bitch pay. Not in person, because... As amusing as it would be, taking the... A crippled pilot in as part of my squad to take down Saren would probably not end well. Anyways. Codex entries. We only have a few. Nothing in primary. We've got something, an update for Bring Down the Sky. On translation. Human cultures remain linguistically divided. Some converse in Spanish, others in Mandarin, Arabic, Swahili, etc. Every alien race has their own equally broad panoply of languages and dialects. Most individuals know only their mother tongue and rely on machine translation. Modern portable computers allow anyone with a few hundred credits of equipment to enjoy seamless real-time translation of alien languages courtesy of handheld PDAs, computers and clothing or jewelry, or subdermal implants. 
without fast and accurate translation, galactic trade and culture could not exist. Governments provide subsidized software, updated through the public extranet on the fly, often as users approach spaceport custom facilities. Even the Batarians, who isolated themselves from, the, from galactic society nearly two decades ago, take pains to provide up-to-date glossaries and linguistics rules, though most suspect this is only so they can continue exporting propaganda. And it's still considered broad-minded and practical to be able to speak without machine aid. Children often take courses in alien language, and most races can speak the simplified artificial trade tongue with little difficulty. Some species must rely on machine translation to interact with the rest of the galaxy. Hanar, for example, cannot reproduce the spoken language of any humanoid species. And other races cannot reproduce Hanar bioluminescence without mechanical aid. Newly discovered or obscure races don't have machine translation available until the linguists have had time to study them. A couple more things about the Asarian Salarians. Asari military doctrine. The Asari military resembles a collection of tribal warrior bands with no national structure. Each community organizes its own unit as the locals see fit and elect a leader to command them. Units from populous cities are large and well equipped. Those from farm villages may be only a few women with small arms. There is no uniform. Everyone wears what they like. The Asari military is not an irregular militia, however. Those who serve are full-time professionals. The average Asari huntress is in the maiden stage of her life and has devoted 20 to 30 years to studying the martial arts. Asari choose to be warriors at a young age, and their education from that point is dedicated to sharpening the mind and body for that sole purpose. When they retire, they possess an alarming proficiency for killing. Huntresses fight individually or in pairs, depending on the tactics preferred in their town. One on one, a huntress is practically unbeatable. Possessing profound tactical insight, a hunter's eye, and a dancer's grace and alacrity. Biotics are common enough that some capability is a requirement to be trained as a huntress. Lack of biotic talent excludes a young Asari from military service. While fluid and mobile, Asari can't stand up in a firestorm in the way the Krogan, Turian, or human could. Since their units are small and typically lack heavy armor and support weapons, they are almost incapable of fighting a conventional war, particularly one of a defensive nature. So Asari units typically undertake special operations missions. Like an army of ninja, they are adept at ambush, infiltration, and assassination, immoralizing and defeating their enemies through intense, focused guerrilla strikes. As a popular Turian saying puts it, the Asari are the finest warriors in the galaxy. Fortunately, there are not many of them. <laughs> I love that. The Asari are blue f female ninjas. <laughs> this was space magic. Love it. Okay, Salarian culture. The rare Salarian females are cloistered on their worlds out of tradition and respect. Powerful female Dalatrasses are dynasts and political kingpins. They determine the political course of their respective regions through shrewd negotiation. <clears throat> Though male Salarians rise to positions of great authority in business, academia, or the military, they rarely have any input on politics. Due to their method of reproduction, Salarians have no concept of romantic love, sexual attraction, 
or the biological impulses and social rituals that complicate human lives. Male-female relationships are rare due to the scarcity of females and more akin to human friendship. Sexuality is strictly for the purpose of reproduction. Ancient social codes determine who gets to fertilize eggs, which produces more daughters and continues a bloodline. Fertilization generally only occurs after months of negotiation between the parents' clans and is done for purposes of political and dynastic alliance. No Salarian would imagine defying this code. Salarian names are quite complex. A full name includes, in order, the name of a Salarian's planet, duchy, barony, fiefdom, family, and finally, the given name. Oh my god. And I thought the Star Wars <clears throat> names for the Chiss were a headache sometimes. This is on a whole nother level. Salarian's government. The Salarian government is called the Salarian Union. It is a labyrinthine web of matrilineal bloodlines with political alliances formed through interbreeding. In many ways, the Salarian political network <coughs> functions like the noble families of Earth's medieval Europe. Structurally, the government consists of fiefdoms, baronies, duchies, planets, and marches, colonization clusters. These are human nicknames. The original Salarian is unpronounceable. Each area is ruled by a single Dalatras, matriarchal head of household, and represents an increasing amount of territory and prestige within the Salarian political web. Approaching 100 members, the first circle of a Salarian's clan comprises parents, siblings, uncles, aunts, and cousins. The next circle includes second cousins, etc., and escalates to well over 1,000 members. The fourth or fifth circle of a clan numbers into the millions. Salarian loyalty is greatest to their first circle and diminishes from there. Their photographic memory allows, Salarian, allows Salarians to recognize all their myriad relatives. And then we have... Salarian Military Doctrine, which we've heard enough about to be able to piece together that it's going to be something to do with information and striking people's weak spots, I think, just based off how much here he was hammering home the our influence stopped so-and-so thing in that speech. In principle, the Salarian military is similar to the Alliance, a small volunteer army that focuses on maneuver warfare. What differentiates the Salarians is not their equipment or doctrine, but their intelligence services and rules of engagement. The Salarians believe that a war should be won before it begins. Conventional wisdom holds that the Salarians know everything about everyone, and this is not far from the truth. In war, the unquestioned superiority of their intelligence services allows them to use their small military to maximum effectiveness. Well before fighting breaks out, they possess complete knowledge of their enemy's positions, intentions, and timetable. In every war the Salarians have fought, they struck first and without warning. For the Salarians to know an enemy plans to attack and to let it happen is folly. To announce their own plans to attack is insanity. They find the human moral concepts of do not fire until fired upon and declare a war before prosecuting it incredibly naive. In defensive wars, they execute devastating preemptive strikes hours before the enemy's own attacks. On the offense, they have never telegraphed their intentions with a declaration of war before attacking. Biotics are virtually unknown in the Salarian military. 
Those with such abilities are considered too valuable to be used as cannon fodder. They're assigned to the intelligence services. While capable of defending themselves against most threats, the Salarians know they are small fish in a universe filled with sharks. As a point of survival, they have cultivated strong alliances with larger powers, particularly with the Turians. Though the relationship between the two species was rocky at first, due to the Krogan uplift, uplift fiasco, the Salarians take pains to keep this relationship strong enough that anyone who might threaten them risks Turian intervention. Alliance military ranks. The Alliance uses a modified version of the ranking system been used for hundreds of years. Soldiers are classified into rank and file enlisted personnel, experienced non-commissioned officers, and specially trained officers. The divide between naval personnel and ground forces, marines, is small. Ground units are a specialized branch of the fleet, just as fighter squadrons are. This unit of command is imposed by the futility of fighting without control of orbit. Without the navy, any army is pointless. The marines, as a matter of pride, contain some of their traditional rank titles. For example, marines have privates and corporals instead of servicemen. In ascending order of responsibility, the ranks of the alliance are... Yeah, I'm not going to bother to read the list of ranks. You can pause it and read for yourself if you like. And we've got something under ships and vehicles, apparently. Yes, crew considerations for starships. Cabins give each individual 10 cubic meters of space. On larger vessels, private rooms are common. As ships get smaller, the number of crew packed into a single wardroom increases. Asari prefer shared spaces, even on larger vessels, while Krogan territorial instincts make it impossible for them to cohabitate even on the smallest ships. On smaller vessels, hot bunking is the norm. Crew members assigned to different watches share the same bunk. When one gets off duty, he wakes, a, he wakes up the person in the bunk. When that crew member is on duty, the first gets his rack time. Spaceship compartments can be isolated by airtight doors in case of decompression. The cinematic vision of explosive decompression is fiction. Hold compartments either take enough damage that the occupants are killed instantly, or leak slowly enough that they are able to reach protective gear. Compartments are equipped with emergency life support apparatus, fireproof plastic bubbles with air bottles. Small ones stowed, Elsa comfortably accommodate one individual inflated. Damage control procedure cuts off ventilation to burning compartments. Without oxygen to consume, fires die in seconds. The compartment is repressurized afterwards for crew recovery. Mass effect fields create an artificial gravity, a graph, plane below the decks presenting muscle atrophy and bone loss in zero-g. Large vessels arrange their decks perpendicular to the thrust axis. The highest decks are at the bow and the lowest at the engines. This allows agrav to work with the inertial effects of thrust. Ships that can land arrange their decks laterally so the crew can move about while the vessel is on the ground. Warships normally turn off their agrav systems during combat, reducing the heat generated by systems and increasing combat endurance. To provide a point of reference for navigating in zero-g, floors are painted a different color from the walls and ceiling.
And that's it for the codex entries. Unless we find one or two new ones. That's also it for this episode. Uh, so, it's been Dark Phoenix Gaming, and thank you for watching my Let's Play Mass Effect Legendary Edition with Vin Shepard. If you've enjoyed this, please leave a like, comment down below, and subscribe for more Mass Effect Space shenanigans. I hope you'll join me next time, when we will actually be heading into the endgame. For realsies this time. See you then, folks. See you then.